you're messing about the day troops today we're going to react to a man called Lowry Tony. Let's go. Lowry Tony, the soldier of three armies. It was October 18, 1965. The outdated South Vietnam Air Force H-34 helicopter hugged tightly to the mountainous terrain of the Phuc San district of Vietnam. As the French and Americans had found, this reliable but old workhorse was not well suited for frontline combat duty due to its slow speed and large silhouette. But maybe most significantly of all, its magnesium skin was prone to very intense and deadly fires if hit. Despite their best efforts, rescue teams could not locate the downed helicopter and its crew or the Special Forces soldiers on board. It was not until over 30 years later that the crash site of the helicopter was found. It was concluded that the helicopter had crashed into the side of a mountain. So just getting straight into this then troops, the helicopter was made of a magnesium like metal variant. Man, that's absolutely insane. So it was prone to massive fires. This is it's crazy to start with. Mountain while flying nap of the earth. Among the remains retrieved at the site was that of an American officer who was the team leader of the mission. He was Captain Larry Thorne, a US military advisor who had also been in World War II, a commander in the German Waffen SS, and a Finnish Army First Lieutenant. He was a highly decorated soldier and his awards included the German Iron Cross, second class, an American Legion of Merit medal, and the highest of Finnish awards, the Mannerheim Cross. Who was this man? Well, he wasn't originally an American, nor was his name Larry Thorne. In fact, his real name was Lauri Torni, and he was born in Vipuri, Finland on May 28, 1919. Just two years before his birth, the Russian Empire had collapsed, allowing Finland to emerge as a new independent nation. Lauri's hometown found itself on the very border with the Soviet Union. And over the next two decades, the Soviet Union became more and more interested in annex. Right, troops, so brief introduction to the man himself. So Larry Thorne, or whatever his original name was, it, obviously that was a, a name that he was going by when he was in, a, in America, I guess. And Larry Thorne is obviously the original name. So we're starting to get into um, the actual guy's um, history now, which is going to be going to be interesting. Annexing Finland. In 1938, Lowry joined the Finnish 4th Independent Jaeger Italian at the age of 19. This wasn't an ordinary unit. It was a CC unit who were experts at sabotage and guerrilla warfare, as well as long-range reconnaissance. They were often considered an elite unit, and their job was to penetrate deep behind enemy lines, often gathering intelligence, operating from concealed positions. Sometimes they would carry out roadside ambushes, even being used to hunt down and destroy enemy special forces. He would soon need these skills, as just a year later in 1939, the Soviet Union carried out an unprovoked attack on Finland called the Winter War. Fighting in the Finnish Army Lauri's battalion was based at Kiviniemi when the war started, tasked with protecting... So he actually started off his military career 19 years old, which is pretty young, in a rather specialist military um, outfit in the Finnish Army. And... The war that was just mentioned there, we actually did a video on this, a person who served within that war, um, his nickname was the White Death, I'll put a link above guys so you can check that out as well. It's interesting then, he's really young when he started his military career off, and he started off in quite an arduous environment. The strategically important leningrad Kitola railroad line. Once it was realized that the Red Army was pouring over the Finnish Soviet border, Lowry's battalion redeployed and moved forward to defend the massive lake at Ladoga. The lake was the largest in Europe and had been shared by the Finnish and the Soviet Union since 1918 and had always been an area of high tension between the two nations. The Red Army attacked the area with overwhelming numbers, but they were ill-equipped, lacking adequate winter equipment. Their tanks were also still painted olive green and their infantry were still wearing brown coats as their camouflage winter clothing had yet to arrive. Lowry's battalion pushed back and surrounded a large number of Red Army troops at Lemeti on the northern part of the lake. Both Lowry's battalion and the winter weather in the form of frostbite inflicted huge casualties on the Red Army divisions encircled there. Lowry took command of the defense of Sugarloaf Hill, a hill that had to be held against the enemy forces in order to maintain Finnish reinforcements. So 
he's proven himself to be a natural leader from the off then. Only a young man, his first major real conflict and he's, he's stepping up the, to the plate already, leading, um, leading men you know, into battle and against a, quite, a, quite a hard force to fight against. Although I will say the fact that they haven't got the correct camouflage uh, is, is insane guys. They're walking around in red, red coats so it wouldn't have been too, too difficult for Larry and his men to spot these guys. So yeah, it's really interesting so far like guys. He's, um, he seems like a pretty legendary guy. The Finnish headquarters couldn't contact the defenders, so Lowry, using his skis, stealthily moved past the Soviet positions, re-establishing communications. Lowry then took command of a group of demoralized Swedish-speaking Finns, defending a key position, conveying orders through gestures, shouting, and punches, because he didn't speak Swedish. Lowry's courageous performance during this engagement came to the attention of his commanding officers, and he was promoted to second lieutenant. But it was ultimately to no avail, for it was a short and bloody war, lasting just over a hundred days. In the end, Finland was forced to concede 11% of its territory, but it was a hollow victory for the Soviet Union. They were thrown out of the League of Nations, their casualties had been truly staggering, and many, including Adolf Hitler, now viewed the Soviet armed forces as a weak and ineffective force. In June 1941, Lowry went to train with the Waffen SS in Austria for seven weeks to gain further specialist skills. As by now, wow! So he's got a lot of recognition early on, troops. I know we're here on one side of the story here, but he must have really done exceptionally well. Although it was only a hundred-day war, he must have done really, really well. And to, to one, get promoted to second lieutenant, and two, he's getting extra training now with these guys. As you can see, it's um. Yeah, things don't happen that quick, guys, unless you, unless you really do meet the mark in the military. You know, it, it's normally done on merit and how well you perform, and this guy seems to be performing exceptionally well. Now, Nazi Germany was a strong ally of Finland. During training, he wore a Waffen-SS uniform and was given the rank of Untersturmführer, or Junior Storm Leader. Ignorant of the political implications, his swearing of the oath of loyalty even after death would later haunt him in the years to come. Much to Lowry's distress, his hometown was... Right, that's interesting. I didn't know that. So, in order for, for that particular military outfit that he then joined, he did train with originally, he had to swear an oath of allegiance that continued after death. I've never heard of that before. That's really interesting. If anyone's heard of that before, please drop me a comment. I'd love to know more about that because... I didn't even know that that was such a thing, to be fair, in certain military outfits, but obviously it was. Yoga region he had fought so hard to protect. Even his barracks at Kiviniemi were all now in Soviet hands. On June 22, 1941, the Germans launched Operation Barbarossa, the surprise attack on the Soviet Union. Three days later, the Finnish attacked too in what became known as the Continuation War. Lowry was back in Finland, put in charge of an armored unit consisting of captured Soviet tanks and armored cars. Finland would not take part in Germany's road to conquest, only advancing as far as its previous territories lost during the Winter War. On March 23, 1942, Lowry was skiing behind enemy lines when he skied over a friendly... Right, so he's, you know, the, the, the picture is, you can kind of see how this is paving out now, guys. He's, um... He's jumping up the ranks and he's getting put in control of various different organizations um, almost on a regular basis here. He's, he's not taking any step backs, he's moving forward constantly, he's impressing everyone around him and he's being put in charge of more and more stuff. But the important thing to remember is he's being put in leadership positions in a fighting capacity. He's not behind a, in a, in a, behind a desk, a pen pusher, so to speak. He's He's literally on the ground fighting and leading men. Pretty awesome. Shrapnel mine while trying to capture enemy prisoners. He was hospitalized but eventually recovered and instead of going on home leave, he went AWOL back to the front. By this time, the conflict had fallen into static trench style warfare and Lowry's unit was tasked with counter guerrilla and counter reconnaissance against Soviet special units that were behind enemy lines. Later, this would move into aggressive actions as they infiltrated behind Soviet lines themselves, taking on Red Army headquarters and communication sites. 
Lowry impressed his superiors and in January 1943 he was given the chance by his senior officers to take command of a deep strike infantry unit that later became known as Detachment Tourney. With the promise of better rations and more active combat during what had become trench warfare, he received countless keen volunteers. With a strict criteria for aggressiveness, physical stamina, and good marksmanship, he rejected those that were unfit and picked the best men. They would take part in sabotage. Wow, that's pretty, pretty impressive troops. He's, you know, we, when I was in the Royal Marines, a testament of a good leader was, um, was those who their men would follow, you know, and want to be part of their section or their troop or their unit. And the fact that he's getting men to volunteer to go to war with him, it's, it's astonishing. And the fact that he actually went AWOL after receiving devastating injuries, he went absent without leave back to the front line. That's absolutely staggering troops. You know, it's no, normally you hear stories of that the other way around where people go absent without leave away from war. So this guy's becoming war hardened and he's, yeah, he seems to really enjoy the combat roles. Sabotage, capturing prisoners and intelligence gathering behind Soviet lines. In one mission, Lowry's unit used rowing boats to get into place. They ambushed a Soviet truck and obtained a bag of intel. Then when a second truck came out of nowhere, moved into close combat using puko knives and axes. More Red Army troops reinforced the position and Lowry's raiders escaped into the forest, stealthily sneaking past Soviet patrols, eventually making it back to the boats. Lowry had made sure that every man knew the enemy intel in case only one of them made it out alive. The unit would succeed in several hit-and-run skirmishes, operating from a base camp that was deep in Soviet territory. They also learned to use the enemy weapons, which created confusion during engagements and made ammo plentiful as they were operating deep in Red Army territory. Lowry and his men soon gained a formidable reputation for bravery and mayhem, to the extent that the Soviets put a bounty of three million Finnish marks on his head as they feared him so much. Wow, so this guy's absolutely smashing things up then he's going around he's he's acting in a capacity of what you know we know special forces to kind of act on it's like he's a shock he's his unit is more shock troop um more of a an assault kind of unit where they're doing short sharp missions behind enemy lines they're using their weapon systems it's um it's guerrilla warfare but they're learning as they go you know these guys are properly battle hardened now by June 1944, the war was all but lost for the Finnish. Despite victory after victory against the Soviet Union, they were simply too outnumbered. For his outstanding bravery and leadership during the battle, Lowry was awarded the Mannerheim Cross on July 9, 1944. That's really impressive too, guys. He's getting, you know, recognized by his superiors as being a formidable leader, and he's getting medals for it now. It's... Um, yeah, no wonder this guy's so well popular. I mean, I've been given recommendations to do this video for a long time now, and I can see why, guys. This guy is phenomenal. September 1944, the Finnish brokered the best deal it could with the Soviet Union, and in effect, the war ended. Most of the Finnish army was demobilizing, including Lowry, who was by now a captain. So, by November 1944, Lowry found himself a civilian, unemployed, and his country forced into a humiliating armistice. Once again, they had to concede territory and pay the Soviet Union reparation. As well as this, key members of the Finnish war were put on trial. Fighting in the German Army Lowry joined the Finnish resistance. Right, so before we get into this next bit then, obviously, do you want to hit on that? After the war ended, you know, he, he was the rank of a captain at the time, on half-decent money probably for the time, and he goes from that to unemployed. And unfortunately for us military guys, I've found that all too a common story. And um, that's where most of the problems occur from, I think, guys. You've got these individuals who's highly trained, skilled and professional who no longer have a specific role. And they just end up, you know, either losing track or rejoining the military in some form. And that's what I believe he did. Right now we're going to get into that. He formed in the event that the Soviets tried to completely occupy Finland. He went to Germany for training in early 1945 with the intention of returning to train the resistance, but ended up joining the German army. He had secretly boarded a U-boat and had taken the alias of Lowry Lane to hide the fact that he was involving himself with the Germans. 
During his training, the German front in the east collapsed and the Red Army were on the borders of Germany. With no ships left, Lowry couldn't return to Finland, so he figured he could fight the Soviets by joining a ragtag band of Germans and was given the rank of a captain. Lowry used the same tactics that he had used so successfully against the Soviets in Finland. He was also joined by a fellow Finn, an officer named Somu Korpela. Soon he had gained a reputation for bravery and his men loyally followed him, even though his grasp of the German language was poor. By March 1945, the German army was defeated. Lowry and his men were fighting for their lives and decided to head west while they still could. This was to avoid the terrible... This is like a Rambo movie, guys. This this person is he's not just cuffing it. He's not just winging the fact that he's a natural-born leader, you know, which could happen, I suppose. But given this opportunity, he's then joined the German military and he's fighting. Then he's been promoted and recognised for his actions yet again. This This person... He's got something in his blood. He's a natural warrior. Fate of falling into the hands of the Red Army. After VE Day, Lowry and his men found themselves behind German lines. Once again, Lowry performed a remarkable feat. He led his unit into Western Germany and he surrendered with his men to the British at Lübeck. By doing so, the Finn had saved himself and the men of his unit from years of captivity in Siberia. Lowry ended up being put in a prisoner of war camp in Lübeck, Germany. He feared that he would be turned over to the Soviets because of his role in the continuation war, or they would discover his involvement in the Waffen-SS. A few months later, in June 1945, he escaped the camp with Somul Korpela and made his way back to Finland. He was arrested, this time by the Finnish state police, but shortly escaped from them too. Lowry was then arrested again in June 1946 and tried for treason for joining the German army when Finland had signed a peace treaty with the Soviets. He was sentenced to six years in prison. During his time in prison, he had made... I can't believe where this is actually going, guys. From fighting Finland, then being unemployed, then making his way to Germany, fighting with the German resistance, and then... He ends up being resisted, arrested, trial for treason. Now he's trying to escape from prison. Is there a boot on this guy? Because if there is, I want to read it. Several escape attempts, which all ended in failure. His last one used a grappling hook made from bed sheets and scrap from the metal shop. He was finally pardoned by the Finnish president in December 1948 and released. Unhappy and disillusioned, Lowry went to Sweden in 1949 under the false name of Elino Morski. He ended up in Venezuela and in 1950 found work on a Swedish cargo ship, the MS Skagen. A few months later, when it was off the coast of Alabama, he jumped ship and swam ashore. He was reduced to doing carpentry and cleaning jobs and in 1953, he was granted a residence visa. Right, so he's now in America then. <laughs> the story gets, it gets better. He's, he's a free-spirited guy. Um, I can see where this is going now. I can definitely see where this is going. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm almost quite proud of this bloke. You know, he's he's a natural born leader, a warrior, and he, he doesn't seem to be defined by his current situation. He's always seeking to improve that situation and he'll do anything possible. Fighting in the US Army. In 1954, at the age of 35, he joined the US Army, adopting the name Larry Thorne. Even though he was a recruit, his experience stood out vastly compared to the other men. His natural leadership abilities gained him rapid promotion, and he was made a first lieutenant in 1957 and then a captain in 1960. He had been stationed in West Germany from 1958 to 1962. During this time, he got in trouble when he got into a bar fight. A fellow Finnish officer pulled some strings and he got Larry transferred to the 10th Special Forces Group. He was able to use his experience to teach skiing, survival, mountaineering, and guerrilla tactics, and learned new skills himself in airborne school. In January 1962, Larry was sent to the Zagros Mountains of Iran in command of his team, where he successfully completed his mission to destroy the top secret material on a crashed US plane. Then in 1963, he was sent to South Vietnam to assist in the formation of local CIDG units. In one particular vicious firefight at Tien Bien near the Cambodian border, 
absolutely insane how experienced this guy's become from a 19 year old joining the, the Finland army to now he's he's working in a special operations capacity in for the US military and he's, he's leading men in uh, some of the most extraordinary circumstances what an experienced man this this person must have had an unbelievable aura about him you know from me serving in the military I can understand that he he must have you know, definitely set set himself apart from the rest, you know, he must have had a fantastic aura. He was awarded two Purple Hearts and a Bronze Star for bravery. The Viet Cong attacked his base in force and breached the outer perimeter, almost overrunning the area. If it wasn't for his determination, the base would have been lost. It is said that in Robin Moore's book, The Green Berets, Captain Steve Corney is based on Larry Thorne. When he returned to the United States, instead of retiring to a desk job, Larry volunteered for a second tour of duty. During his second tour of duty on October 18, 1965, Larry was put in command of a top secret special forces unit called MACV SOG, trying to locate Viet Cong turnaround points along the Ho Chi Minh Trail when his helicopter crashed in the mountains and he was killed. His remains went undiscovered for over 30 years. Lowry earned the Distinguished Flying Cross and was promoted to Major posthumously. His name is honored on the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Washington, D.C., and in 2003, his remains were brought back to America. He was buried with full military honors at Arlington National Cemetery in Virginia. Wow, so that's quite a sad, sad end to an absolute warrior, troops. I was going to say Finland should be proud and... But then I thought Germany can be proud and then I'm thinking the United States can be proud. And then I'm thinking we all can be proud of this individual because we can learn so much about him. The fact that he was courageous, he wasn't defined by his current situation. He had the um, tenacity to go seek something better in life. And he did something which um, he believed in. He thought he was doing better and in many ways he did, you know. I'm guessing the guys who served with him had the pleasure of that, would have said the same thing. This guy was an unbelievable leader, and that's a fascinating story, a one that I definitely want to know more about. If there's anything you can recommend to me, guys, regards to this person, please join the Discord group and drop me um, a few su suggestions. The link is in the description. If you like my content, troops, consider subscribing if you wish. I'd, I'd really appreciate that and um, like the video but other than that troops will um, leave it there and I hope you have a wonderful day